Dear friends, dear comrades, if I ask myself why we are progressives, Democrats, socialists, why we need this organization, I only need to look to the people of Africa and the struggles of parties such as the ANC, which today celebrates the 100th anniversary. Despite the oppression, poverty, apartheid, and destitution, the people of South Africa and the leadership of the ANC never gave up. Then, as today, the African people, men, but so very much the proud women of Africa too, seem to always carry a deep sense of hope, the vigor for change, and have welcomed us with a warm smile of hospitality. We thank our hosts, the ANC, President Zuma, you, Vice President Modlante, for such hospitality. We are honored that we are here to celebrate with you the 100 years of struggles which came to fruition under the inspired leadership of Nelson Mandela. And I am reminded And I am reminded that it was here in South Africa in 1906 that Mahatma Gandhi adopted the term Satyagraha that launched a dynamic form of civil nonviolent resistance. Satyagraha inspired Nelson Mandela in his struggle, but also Martin Luther King. The power of truth for our movement has major significance at times when distortion of reality has become a political weapon of an establishment unwilling to change. Yes, in good times or bad, our movement has stood by our member parties and our peoples in their struggles for a better world, struggles for freedom. Dear friends, if one were to ask, why the SI? Why should we exist? I would begin with the values, the values of solidarity, for peace, for democracy, for justice, good governance, for equality, human rights, women's rights, and for growth that brings welfare, well-being, sustainable quality of life, and employment for all. But let me also on a personal note say that I have witnessed incredible solidarity at different times in my life. Many years ago, a young boy of 14, I was threatened under gunpoint as my father was arrested by the military for the crime of fighting for social and democratic change in Greece. Then the voices ready to stand up were on the international scene, the progressive socialist parties, governments, unions, mobilizing against dictators for democracy in Greece, Portugal, Spain, all the way to Latin America. My family found refuge and welcome in the social democratic societies of the North. And we were inspired by the work of leaders such as Willy Brandt, Bruno Kreisky, Olof Palme, and others. The past year, we have shown solidarity to democratic struggles around the Arab world, Africa, Syria, Palestine, Myanmar. Together, we have made proposals, developed ideas and policies, pushed for alternatives in a very different world. And we were, and we are right to do so. The global economy continues to be in crisis. As Gordon Brown rightly states in his recent book, the argument that the economy operates according to iron laws and the only role of men and women is to live by these laws, this dictates and demeans our humanity, despite the massive unemployment and suffering around the world. Because, as he says, there are always options, choices, always solutions that human ingenuity can summon. Yet, friends, these alternatives have not been adopted because I believe this human ingenuity needs to be accompanied by the political and democratic will to make these changes. That will, my friends, has been lacking in Europe and around the world. And this I say to you not as an academic, but from my personal experience. I know, I saw, and I fought for change with you. I saw, and we all see, the inertia that continues to cripple the global economy. One of the reasons our progressive alternative has failed to take hold globally 
after the most dire crisis of capitalism since the Great Depression, is that it is much more difficult to make these changes at the national level in a globalized economy. Cooperation, coordination, regional and global governance structures are needed, and I will return to this point later. Yes, cooperation amongst us, a unity of purpose and action is of utmost importance if we are to change this world. But before I return to this point, let me again from my experience tell you that the dominant free market ideology has crippled our thinking. Again, I saw, I saw the blind spots, the ideological dogmatism, the false assumptions and the special interests the conservative forces represent. Crippling our collective capability to look for alternatives. Despite that, our family did table viable alternatives. Dear friends, we have never denied the usefulness of markets. What we have denied is that there is such a thing as a market, as a free, omniscient, infallible market power. The recent LIBOR scandal is just one more of many current examples of the fallibility and corruptibility of the global financial enterprise. No, all markets, all markets have their rules and regulations. So the real question is, what rules, who makes the rules, and who do these rules benefit? And as a progressive, I want to see our societies, our communities, our families, our citizens make the rules. The markets will not shape our values and morals. It is we that must and can define the values the markets must serve. The myth, however, of the free market has served the conservatives well as they are able to hide the real interest behind this dogma. Let me be more specific. The freedom to move capital through banks, hedge funds, CDSs, in and out of national economies in nanoseconds, through instant decisions only a supercomputer can make, is no freedom at all. Some make huge profits, but it creates insecurity for our peoples, our economies, our citizen savings, investments, and welfare. Our movement has made crucial proposals on the establishment of a financial transaction tax, a way to curtail excess speculation and use the rest to create revenues for investment. Similar proposals to minimize risks to our economies have been made by our parties in Europe, such as a banking union, a European credit rating agency, and euro bonds. The freedom to employ cheap labor, labor cheaply in countries without labor laws, without collective bargaining, without environmental standards or working environment conditions, is no freedom at all. It only pits the poor employees of one developing or emerging market country against the workers and employees of other, more developed countries. Developed countries where societies have been able to establish a decent life, a welfare system through struggles, a democratic participation in economic decision making through social partner cooperation. No competitiveness needs not be promoted through a race to the bottom, but through a race to the top. This is why our Commission on the Financial Crisis in a recent meeting in New York proposed that the WTO, the IMF, and the World Bank do not see competitiveness through lowering the standards in the developed countries, but through coordinated increase of wages and living standards of the people in emerging and developing economies. But this brings me to another so-called freedom. The freedom to move your money to tax havens to avoid taxes is no freedom at all. It is said that 21 trillion is hidden in tax havens around the world. The Cayman Islands alone hold over 2 trillion in U.S. Treasuries. This is not freedom. Whether it is in developed or developing nations, it is our citizens that are being robbed. Plain robbery in our countries, of our country's economies, denying us the capacity to invest in welfare, education, and green growth. I know this. Greece is suffering from this. Had this alone been tackled, Greece would most likely never have needed a bailout. Yet Europe, the G8, G20, the banking system, despite my pleas as Prime Minister, despite token reference in our Council or G20 decisions, have done nothing to change this. It is our movement 
that has always been in favor of global regulation and transparency in the financial markets. Dear friends, the freedom to exploit natural resources as one wishes, water, oil, minerals, wildlife, oxygen, forests, is no freedom at all. We are robbing the generations to come and undermining our welfare and existence. The race for resources is on, and their scarcity, whether it is water or oil, minerals or arable land, is becoming central to today's and to future conflicts. And more than enough money is wasted on weapons and war today. According to an African economist, Dambisa Moyo, in the U.S. alone, it is estimated that 17, 75 billion worth of edible food is wasted every year. Economist Robert Skidelsky wonders how much is enough. The water we use to grow food that is then thrown out by industry or consumers could provide enough water for the domestic needs of over 9 billion people. One billion souls that go without food every day, most in sub-Saharan Africa, are a stark contrast to the one billion deemed medically obese in our world. This is not only waste, but it also hikes the global prices of food, forcing the poor to pay more. Something is wrong as our decisions have created irrational rather than rational markets. We need the right market regulation and global governance that will promote a new model of sustainable, healthy growth. And our movement has tabled proposals on sustainable green growth, a tax on greenhouse gases, greenhouse gases, and has been active in all fora from Copenhagen to Cancun to Durban to Rio. The freedom to amass huge wealth with little or no redistribution with a financial system of betting tax evasion is no freedom at all. Economists from James Galbraith to Paul Krugram to Bob Reich agree that this inequality is at the core of today's financial, economic, social, and political problems. And if you think I'm quoting only progressive thinkers, let me tell you that even the chief economist of the IMF recently stated that inequality was a major threat to our economic growth and welfare. Trickle-down theories of growth have failed. With enlightened exceptions, the rich 1% and the financial system have downgraded the real economy, have invested little in innovation or education, while employment, youth, and women suffer. With such concentration of wealth, politics is also overpowered. An oligarchy of a few bankers are today much more powerful than elected governments or prime ministers or even nation states. I know from my experience. Again, I've seen. Joe Stiglitz rightfully says that the bank's investment in politics has been more profitable than their investments in finance. Not mincing his words, he says that money to politicians, whether through lobbies or outright bribes, have shaped regulation and rules in favor of the rich and powerful. One example, the pharmaceutical industry in the U.S. lobbied for one phrase, that the U.S. government not be allowed to negotiate drug prices with the industry. This phrase cost the healthcare system 50 billion over the last 10 years. Another example is the investment of the rich in media and think tanks. Whether Italy's Berlusconi or Murdoch in the U.K., we see around the world newspapers, TV stations, even websites handed over to strong oligopolies. And we know, of course, the lobbies that pushed against transparency and the monitoring of the financial system, which resulted in the toxic bonds and the 2008 Wall Street crash. What freedom is this? Dear friends, this is not a fight between free markets and the state. This is a false dichotomy. This is no free market. This is a market made for the powerful. This is what Richard Freeman calls economic feudalism, Luigi Zingales clientelism, others crony capitalism. This is a fight between two clear choices, whether on the one hand markets and governments hand in hand serve the few and the powerful, or whether they both, markets and governments, serve the common good, our citizens' interests, not the 1%, not the 99%, but 
of our population, emancipating, empowering a free people. Let me ask you, does freedom include the right of the powerful to use their money to fund, lobby, influence, and essentially bribe the political world, holding the rest of the society captive to the wills of special interests? Many have accepted the inevitability of such a process. I and we refuse to do so, for we represent a very different and deeper understanding of what freedom is. We see freedom as the emancipation of women. We see freedom for our citizens, our youth, to feel secure, to learn, to be educated, to live a healthy life. Freedom to work and create throughout one's life. Freedom from injustice and oppression. Freedom from inequality. Freedom from want of famine, poverty, and pandemics. Freedom from violence, wars, and terror. Freedom from human trafficking and sexual exploitation. Freedom from walls that divide cities, occupations, and illegal settlements, whether in Ber Berlin in the past, or in Palestine or Cyprus. Freedom from fundamentalisms, dogmatisms, and fanaticisms. Freedom from prejudice, hatred, racism, and xenophobia that divide and weaken our societies. Freedom to live in a natural, clean, sustainable environment. Freedom to access information, the internet, the commonwealth of human knowledge. Freedom of communication, expression, personal, and collective creativity. Freedom to participate, decide in our public matters. Our understanding of freedom is one of empowerment. empowerment. Empowering our citizens means redistributing power, knowledge, and capacities. This is our democratic challenge. These deep inequalities today are sustained by the fact that a globalized society, this wild west if you like, is not a regulated one. But attention, there is a very important element we cannot overlook. The generations before us could fight and achieve a golden period of social democracy at the national level. Today, a system of inequity is thriving in the stratosphere of globalization, where few rules and regulations exist. Or let me correct myself. It is regulated for the few and the powerful. Regulation that leads to the concentration of wealth. In contrast from yesterday, today the concentration of wealth and power go beyond our borders, beyond our national democratic controls, beyond our citizens' reach, beyond the rule of law, beyond our planet's capacity. This is why I believe it's the basic reason our youth today is alienated from politics. We are still, in our vast majority, national politicians, yet capital is global. Our challenges are global. And our younger generation, surfing through the internet, is rightly convinced that humanity has the knowledge, the money, the technology to tackle almost any problem successfully, from climate change to pandemics, to illiteracy and poverty, growth and employment. Yet they see us politicians as incapable or blocked because we are confined to our national borders, our national politics, because it is increasingly difficult to have social democracy in one country. This is further a reason why our movement faces obstacles. It is not only the dominant ideology, but an oligarchy of powerful interests that dominate our international society. This is why we have chosen as our theme for our Congress a new internationalism, a new culture of solidarity. We must take our work beyond our national borders. We can and must work closely to inspire our younger generation that there is hope in progressive politics, in democratic discourse. Uniting, cooperating, coordinating, as so many of the international elite do, to succeed in transforming our global economy into one with democratic governance and regulation that serves our peoples for a just global society. Dear friends, in recent years, in a very conservative Europe, and a crisis of runaway capitalism, I found understanding and solidarity from the progressive social and democratic forces around the world. I found your solidarity, for which I am thankful. You understood that my struggle as Prime Minister of Greece was not one to impose austerity as an end or as a goal, but rather a difficult necessity in a hostile environment to give time and hope so that Greece make the deeper necessary changes. As a national tragedy loomed, I fought for my people, with my people, against all odds, and we remained alive, standing, and proud. 
With your solidarity, of which I'm once again profoundly grateful, we're standing right before you, and I'm standing right before you, and saying, no matter how hard things seem today, our values can prevail, I know they can, I know we can, and we can create not only a Greece, but a world of sustainable and just development. Dear friends, you also understand that the conservative interpretation that markets are infallible puts the onus of the problems on the average citizen and not on the powerful. For who is ultimately to blame for this crisis? It's the bad nations, we are told. It's the lazy people. It's the southerners, those terrible pigs, P-I-G-S. It's the foreigners. It's the immigrants. It's you, not me. We are told to point the figure, finger at each other rather than reach out a hand to lift, lift each other up. It is no surprise that we have seen a spectacular spike in nationalism over the past few years. At the same time, we have witnessed the terrifying rise of racism and prejudice. You understand, as statistics bear out, that it is not the lazy Greeks, the profligate and unproductive Southerners, the pigs, the Portuguese, Italians, Greeks, and Spaniards that are to blame. Amartya Sen tells us that it is our institutions, our freedom, that defines development. The more democratic transparent we become, the more developed our society can be. He says democracy cannot be taken for granted. Europe has led the world in the practice of democracy. It is therefore worrying that the dangers to democratic governance today coming through the back door of financial priority are not receiving the attention they should, is what Amartya Sen is saying. So this blame game in Europe is dangerous. It is undermining democracy by cultivating a resurgence of ugly nationalism and neo-fascism. And while we bear each of us responsibility for our own countries, prejudice is hiding the real issues at hand. I say this with some anger, as according to the OECD, Greeks work harder than any other member country, second only to the South Koreans. And we as a socialist government, have affected, again according to the OECD, more reforms than any other industrial, industrialized nation in the past three years. In Greece, we socialists inherited a huge deficit in debt from the right. We inherited wasteful clientelistic politics. This is all the more reason we need to strengthen our solidarity, understanding, and empathy with each other. And I found this solidarity in our family. And I pledge to work hard to reach out to all who need this solidarity in our movement, in my capacity as President of the Socialist International. In conclusion, friends and comrades, at no time in human history have we had the capacity to solve the world's most pressing problems than we have today. Above all, we know that we can humanize globalization, as in the past we have humanized capitalism. Beyond our cooperation in the international arena, our fight, your fight, will continue to be centrally at the national level. This is where the SI, fueled by the strength of its member parties, can and must lead the way. We are an international movement, but our strengths are our parties. But let me be clear, we too on the left must adapt to these changing times combine our movement's enduring values with new approaches, as Vice President Modlanta rightly has stated, stated. Let us continue our constructive work on the financial crisis and climate change. But let us look into new issues, whether it is drug trafficking or, or intellectual property, protection of privacy on the internet to open access to government and corporate data for all citizens. Let us look to see how we can further empower our parties and leaders, our women, our youth, our migrant communities. Through education, through leadership training, through online distance learning. Let us learn from each other. It may come as a surprise, but South Africa, whose progressive use of technology, for example, has created one of the most efficient tax systems in the developing world. Let us also engage with citizens in a deeper way, from civil society to youth. Crowdsourcing and social media can no longer be buzzwords, but must be primary levers of policy and action in our movement. The Arab youth has shown us new ways. 
Let's prioritize online transparency initiatives and actions and raise accountability in governments, in corporations, and international organizations. And we can do so only if our fight is for more democracy, not less, more equality, not less, more citizen participation, not less, more social awareness, not less, more empathy, not less, more questioning, self-assessment, critical thinking, not less. This crisis, my friends, has shown that many shortcomings of our current form of capitalism exist. We can, we must forge a global social pact, a new deal at the global level for our citizens. When free marketeers told the Africans that there is no alternative, T-I-N-A, TINA, the acronym, the Africans came up with a, another acronym, FEMBA, short for there must be an alternative. Our challenge is to prove that there is an alternative. So let me end with a democratic challenge. The era of colonialism is over, but in those nations that suffered as colonies, the rich opportunities to not only establish democracy, but to carry the idea of democracy beyond its stale and exhausted forms in the West remains a core challenge. Call this the challenge of moving democracy forward. Western democracies have shown so far how weak governments are in facing global capital, an analysis that the SI understands, but that the bourgeois press and politicians constantly obscure and ignore. This means that more global crises lie ahead, crises that hurt everyone everywhere. This is a challenge to widen and deepen democracy's scope. The explosion of material production in quantitative terms is unmatched by material distribution in qualitative terms. Two centuries ago, nearly all people everywhere were poor because there was too little. Today we stand at a crossroads where poverty exists increasingly as a failure of fair distribution, not failed production. I would call this our challenge to extend democratic justice to all. In talking with one of my friends, a South African, George Bezos, Nelson Mandela's lawyer in the most difficult times, he reminds me that Nelson Mandela has said that if Greece is the mother of democracy, South Africa is her youngest daughter. So why not South Africa, progressive Africa, take on the moral leadership in defining a new era of democracy, deeply reconceived, that will move past the democracy of the colonizers to a global democracy that fairly shares abundance as the beginning of an entirely new age. Combining green growth and investment, equality and justice, and democracy. Together, we will make this vision a reality. Thank you.